Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Gospel Truth broadcast. Today I want to share something with you that I consider to be one of the very most important things that God ever showed me. I say that about a lot of things I teach, and they're all important. I mean, there's, there's just many aspects to living a life that uh, is full and, and abundant the way that God intended us to. But let me just share with you very quickly, I got born again when I was eight years old. It was a genuine conversion. The very next day in my third grade class, I, my friends could tell a difference in me, and they asked me, and I told them I'd been born again. And I mean, there was a noticeable difference in my life, so I was saved. But then I became stuck. I became religious. And I fell into the trap of thinking I had to be good enough to earn God's favor, and I was on this treadmill trying to perform and never obtaining. And 10 years later, when I was 18 years old, I just came to the end of myself, and I turned myself inside out, confessed all my hypocrisy, and when I came to the end of myself, I experienced God pouring His Holy Spirit out in my life. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I received power. It just radically, radically changed me. And you would think after such a dramatic experience. I mean, for four and a half months, I was caught up in the presence of God. And you would think, well, then you just lived happily ever after. Not so. You know, then began a conflict in my life because I had experienced God's love and power and joy, and I experienced it at my when I was at my very worst, the first time I ever really recognized how much of a hypocrite I was and how self-righteous I was. I experienced this tremendous relationship with the Lord, but after four and a half months, the feeling, the emotion was gone, and now I was trying to reconcile what I felt in my heart with what I believed in my head, and I'd always been taught that God loved me based on how holy I was, and yet I had experienced something totally different. And there was like this collision between my experience and my mind. And let me just make a statement here that some people haven't thought this through, but this is really important. That the scripture says, as a man thinks in his heart, that's the way he's going to be. Proverbs 23, 7, and there's just many other scriptures that go along with that. It doesn't matter what your encounter with the Lord is. The way you think will ultimately be the way that your life goes. Now that is a major, major major point. And a lack of understanding that is the reason most people don't guard what they think. That's the reason that they're plugged into this secular world. They watch the movies, they read all of the blogs, they spend time on the internet, and they do these things that are exposing them to thoughts and values completely contrary to what they want in their life. And then they can't understand why their life seems to be going that direction. It's because you put garbage in, garbage comes out. It's one of the greatest truths in the Bible that as you think in your heart, that's the way you're going to be. Now, I had experienced the love of God and the power of God, but my thinking wasn't instantly renewed. You don't just, you can't have somebody wave their hand over you and get your mind to change. Even though instances, experiences can impact what you think. They don't necessarily dictate what you think. Think, thought is a systematic process and you have to renew your mind. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says that you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the word transform there comes from the Greek word metamorpho where we get metamorphosis from. If you want to change like a little worm spins a cocoon and then comes out the other side a butterfly, if you want to change from something that's earthbound to something that is just beautiful and able to fly, if you want that kind of metamorphosis, transformation in your life, it comes through the renewing of your mind. So I say all of this to say that I had experienced God's unconditional love and mercy. I had experienced God in a way that was powerful, but my thinking was in conflict to that. And if God hadn't have shown me these truths of spirit, so what I call spirit, soul, and body, I would have lost. I am absolutely convinced that I would have lost 
the tremendous benefit of this experience in my life. So this revelation, this teaching of spirit, soul, and body changed me. And I believe it has the power to change every single person. In my estimation, this is one of the most foundational, fundamental things that you can understand. Real quickly, let me just refer to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Over there, Paul's praying a prayer, and he says, I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. Now, there's a lot of things you could teach from that verse, but I'm just using that as one example to show that you have a spirit, soul, and body. Not two parts, three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. Functionally, most people only acknowledge the body and the soul. The body is obvious. You're looking at my body, and you can see your body in a mirror. All of us are aware of what your body looks like, whether you're tall, short, fat, skinny, male, female. You know your physical body. But we also know that there is an inner part that isn't just physical. Like you could feel fine. You could be in health, and you could all of these things. Nobody touches you physically. They didn't touch your body, and yet they could say a word that could just break your heart, and you could experience hurt and pain that isn't physical. There is a soul, an inner part, and every person is aware of that part. The body and the soul, you just instinctively, automatically know how they are. You know, if I was to ask you right now, uh, how are you? Do you have any pain in your body? You don't have to say, well, let me pray. And let me seek the Lord and let me, uh, I'll come back to you in a week and I'll tell you how I am. You don't do that. You know if you feel pain or not. It's just something that you automatically know. You could be asleep and if you had a pain in your body, it would wake you up. You are in touch with your physical body. And if I was to ask you, so how are you feeling today? You don't have to say, well, let me think about it and pray about it and I'll come back to you in a week and tell you. You know whether you are happy or sad, depressed, encouraged. You are monitoring this soul. Your soul and your body you are in touch with constantly, and really nobody uh, can argue the fact about your body and soul. But according to Scripture, you're three parts. And there's many verses, but that one that I've already quoted, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, so shows that you have a spirit, soul, and body. And the spirit part of us, you can't know. You aren't in touch with that. If I was to ask you, what are you like in your spirit? Most of you would draw a blank or some people confuse the soul and the spirit. They get them mixed up and they think that they're the same thing. Functionally, most people only believe that there's two parts. But the Bible shows that there's three parts of you. And here's the reason this is so important. Like I said, I experienced a miraculous encounter with the Lord. And I just knew, I could feel, I could perceive that God loved me, that God was with me. But over a period of time, feelings quit. I could spend hours talking about that, but God doesn't want you to just live in a realm to where you can always feel all of these things. The Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 63, this was Jesus speaking. And he says, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are alive. Jesus there put a greater emphasis on the spirit than the flesh, which is a combination term for soul and spirit. I mean soul and body, excuse me. The flesh refers to your soul and body portion, but the spirit part is the real life-giving part of you. And here's the reason that this really impacted my life, because... I found out that there was a third part of me that I wasn't really aware of. You know, if you want to see if your body, what it looks like, you can go look in a mirror. If you want to see if your hair's come, you go look in a mirror. But if you want to see what your spirit's like, you can't look in a mirror. You can't see your spirit in a mirror. You can't feel your spirit by just your emotions and things like this. How do you know what your spirit is like? Romans chapter 8, verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What is spiritually minded? Again, I refer back to John 6, 63. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If you want to see what your spirit's like, you have to go to the Word of God and believe what it says. 
If you want to see what your, if your hair is combed, you can't go by how it feels. You go look in a mirror and you take appropriate action based on what you see. If you want to see what your spirit's like, you cannot go by how you feel. You know, I could spend days, weeks trying to emphasize this. I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit would supernaturally take what I'm saying and show you the importance of this because functionally, most people, even most Christians, do not know who they are in the Spirit. They go by how they feel. And I'm telling you that there is a third part of you, the Spirit, that has been completely changed. And this is the key to relationship with God. God said this in John chapter 4, verse 24. Jesus was speaking and He says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are alive. Excuse me, I misquoted that. It's John 6, 63. I was thinking of John 4, 24. Man, I just had a brain cloud there. See, my soul and my body aren't perfect, but my spirit knows all things. But John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit and God is looking at you in the spirit realm. See, God isn't looking at you just based on the body. Boy, this is so important. There's a scripture, I forget the exact reference in the Old Testament, I think it's the book of Amos, but it says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? God is a spirit. God is looking at you in the spirit. Most of us, we are a spirit, soul, and body, but most of us put the emphasis on the body and the soul part. So most of us are looking at our physical body, our performance, how we look, how we feel, and our emotions, and we think that that's the real us. And so here we have this impression of us. God is seeing us in the spirit, and we aren't agreed. In the spirit, you are a completely brand new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, what is that talking about? That's not talking about your body. If you were a man or a woman before you got saved, you're still going to be a man or a woman. Your body isn't changed. If you were fat before you got saved, you're still going to be fat after you get saved. That part of you is not the part that passed away and all things became new. It's also obvious that this isn't talking about your soul because if you were outgoing before you got saved, you'll still be outgoing after you got saved. If you were an introvert before, you'll still be an introvert after. Now, those things can change, but they just aren't instantly changed. You could say it this way. If you were stupid before you got saved, you'll still be stupid after you get saved unless you begin to renew your mind. You still have the same thoughts. You still remember things. You didn't just instantly change in your soulish realm. So you can tell by observation that your body hasn't changed, your soul hasn't changed, and yet the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you are in Christ, old things have passed away. It's not talking about are going to, are in the process. It says it's already done. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things, not some things, but all things. And it didn't say that they are in the process of becoming new. It says all things are new. That cannot be observed in your body. It cannot be observed in your soulish, your mental, emotional part. But there is a third part of you, the spirit. And that spirit person is completely brand new. And it is completely the work of God. Again, I refer back to John 4, 24, that God is a spirit. And he sees you in the spirit and relates to you. And in the spirit, you are now his workmanship. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then it says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Our body and our soul are being influenced by this born-again part, and they are in the process of changing. But they are not completely His workmanship yet. But in the Spirit... You are completely brand new. You are a new species of being that never existed before. In Ephesians 4.24, it says, Put on the new man, which is a terminology that's always referring to this part of you that got saved and born again. It says, Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Man, that's a major statement. I have met so many people 
who are praying and saying, Oh God, make me righteous. Oh God, help me to be holy. And it's because they are only looking in the body and in the soulish realm, and they aren't observing all of their actions being perfect. All of their thoughts aren't perfect. And so they're praying for perfection out here in the body. That is not how it happens. You get changed on the inside, and in the spirit you were created righteous and holy. Your spirit is as pure, as righteous, and holy right this moment as it will ever be in eternity. Your spirit is perfect. There is no sin. There is no inadequacy. There is no fear. There's no depression. There's no discouragement. There is not anything negative in your spirit. Your born-again spirit is identical to Jesus. And I know some people choke on that, but here's a verse that says that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. It didn't say, so are we going to be in the future world. There's other scriptures that talk about how our body is going to be changed, how we will know all things, even as also we are known, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Those are future things in the body and in the soulish realm that are going to change. But right now, 1 John 4, 17 says, As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Now, there is no way to understand that verse if you are thinking only in the body and in the soulish realm because your body isn't as Jesus it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that this mortal is going to have to put on incor uh, immortality, this corruptible, put on incorruption. Your body has to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. It says in 1 Corinthians 13 that we will know all things even as also we are known, but that's certainly not true now. Your body and soul are in the process of change and there will be a completion that takes place when we get caught up to be with the Lord or if He comes back, if we die we are going to get this glorified body, and that is a future thing. But the Scripture says, as He is, so are we in this world. The only way to understand that is it's talking about your spirit. Your spirit is a part of you that is already changed. One-third of your salvation is complete. It's over. When you die and go to be with the Lord, or if the Lord comes back and we receive this glorified body, you're gonna, your body's going to be changed, your mind will be changed, but your spirit is right now identical to the way it'll be in eternity. It's identical to Jesus. As Jesus is, that's the way that we are. And I tell you, when I saw this, it changed my life. It totally, totally changed my life. Because, see, I had experienced a touch from God, and I knew that God was awesome, and I knew that God loved me, and I knew that God had power, but I was looking at myself in the body and in the soul, and I didn't always act right, I didn't always talk right, I didn't always think right, and because of that, I just had a disconnect. How could holy, almighty God love me and really use me because I could see these flaws in me. But see, I was looking on the flesh. God was looking in the heart. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must, not should, or you get best results, but it says you must worship Him in spirit and in truth. When I understood that it was my spirit that's changed, God is a spirit. He's looking at me in the spirit. God accepts me based on what He did in my born-again spirit. And when I begin to base my life on who I am in Christ and not on my own works, it radically, radically changed my relationship with God. For the first time, I was able to embrace the fact that God loved me. Prior to that time, I had experienced it but I didn't understand it. And the scripture says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, Jesus was teaching about the parable of the sower sowing the seed. And he says that these people that didn't understand, Satan came immediately and stole away the word. If you can't understand, you will lose it. Satan will steal it from you. And I was in danger of losing this tremendous experience I had with God because I just couldn't understand. How could a holy God love me? I didn't like me. 
I saw all kinds of things that I didn't like. But see, I was only looking in the flesh, the outward person. I wasn't seeing who I was in Christ. And when I got this revelation of spirit, soul, and body and understood that in the spirit as Jesus is, not was or is going to be as he is right this moment, that's exactly the way I am in my spirit. All of a sudden, I now understood how God could love me because he had changed me. I'd become a new creature, and he was looking at me in the spirit, and in the spirit, I was perfect. I was created in righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4, 24. It also says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the Greek word there for one is hes, H-E-I-S, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. We aren't just similar. I'm not just got a little bit of God's power and anointing in me. It says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one. We are identical. In the spirit realm, we are ounce for ounce and molecule for molecule, if there are such things in the spirit realm, identical to Jesus. When I understood that, it opened up my relationship with God because now I understood I had been created in righteousness and true holiness. God was just to love me because he wasn't dealing with me based on my sin and failure in the flesh. He was based on my new creation in the spirit. It opened up all kinds of things to me to recognize that God's power wasn't just out there and I had to do something to pray it down or earn it, but it was already in me. And it was infinitely easier to release something that I believed I already had than it was to try and go get something that I didn't have. It changed my whole approach towards releasing the power of God. And it really boiled Christianity down to this simple truth, that in my spirit, I'm as saved as I'll ever be. I'm as holy and righteous as Jesus is. I have his faith, his power, his anointing. All of this is in my spirit. And all I have to do is renew my mind. Your three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is perfect when you get born again. And if you get your mind in agreement with your spirit, it's two against one. That's a majority. And you know what? Your body will be healed. It'll start operating in joy, peace, power. You'll see the anointing of God flow through you. But if your mind is over here and you, but I don't feel the power of God. I can't see it in the mirror. I still look sick. I, here's what the doctor said. If your mind gets in agreement with your flesh, that's two against one. And even though you have this life of God in your spirit, it'll be shut off. And so it really comes down to the renewing of your mind. My spirit's already perfect. If I get my mind into agreement with my spirit, it's a simple majority. I will begin to start experiencing the power of God. Or as it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, this, like I said, is one of the most important things in my life, but I'm out of time. I would like to encourage you to please get the resource materials that we're offering on this. This could change your life. It certainly has mine.